Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adrian DeCutter, and I'm going to be moderating this breakout session at Balancing Farm, Family, and Stress. Um, I have with me Randy Sims, Michael Downey, and Michael Moore, and I'll share them a bit about them in just a few moments, but I wanted to welcome you all to this breakout session. Um, I do want to mention that there will be one CEU in professional, professional development available for attending this breakout session, and we will talk to you at the end about how you can um, access your credit there. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to partner with CCAs to offer this additional benefit. So my name is Adrienne DeSutter, and as I said, I'll be moderating the panel today. Uh, I joined my husband's fourth generation farm family, oh, when I met him around 10 years ago, um, and we, we are grain farmers here in Midwest Illinois. We've also got a small herd of cattle and a small herd of children. <laughs> um, I've got a master's degree in counseling, and, and uh, so my husband and I, we kind of married our passions for agriculture and mental health, um, and so we do a lot of advocating now. Um, I have a role as an ag mental health specialist, and um, I do a lot of public speaking opportunities and just helping um, connect resources between farmers and organizations um, in the mental health arena. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the rest of our panel briefly. Um, we've got uh, Randy Sims. He grew up on a family farm in West Central Illinois, received his degree in agricultural economics from the University of Illinois in 1969, and after graduating, worked for his father and uncle on the family farm. He now runs and operates a family farm near Liberty, Illinois with his wife and son. Randy has served on local and national boards, is a lifetime member of the Farm Bureau, and is acting president of their farming enterprises. His expertise comes from his strong education, history, and real life experiences on the farm. We know those are so valuable. Uh, Michael Downey is joining us. We're going to refer to him as Mike today. Hopefully I'll keep that straight with a Mike and a Michael. Uh, Mike grew up on a family farm in West Central Illinois near Roseville. He received his degree in agricultural business from the University of Illinois in 2000 and began his career in the farm management and real estate industry. He has since joined Farm Financial Strategies to pursue his interest in helping farm families with their estate planning and strategies for passing the farm to the next generation. Downey is also co-owner of Next Generation Ag Advocates, which was founded in 2018 by two farmers from Iowa to help match retiring farmers who don't have a successor to like-minded producers. Finally, we have Michael Moore, who started farming with his parents in 2014 near Roseville, Illinois, growing corn, soybeans, and feeder cattle. Moore is also responsible for all technological aspects of the farm. He received his bachelor's degree in horticulture and landscape management from Illinois State University in 2011, and was employed by a landscaping company near Chicago prior to uh, coming home to the farm. He serves on committees at his church, sings in their sanctuary choir, the, oh, you're going to have to help me with this one, ec ecumenical singers, and choral dynamics in Gillsburg. Moore enjoys teaching with the Ag Day for Kids program, is a Chicago sports fan, and enjoys spending time with his family. Um, so that's just a little bit about our panel today. I do want to mention quickly before we get started um, that we do have a uh, a poll set up for you. So if you click on polling on the left side navigation bar, you may have to click the live now button to find that, but you're going to click on the polling bar and you're going to see four polls appear, um, which each have a vote now button. So you'll submit, you know, click on your answer, click uh, vote now to submit your vote. And then there's some little button, little circles underneath those questions that you can, you have to click on the circle to go to the next question. I believe there's four in there. So at any time, if you want to hop on and do those poll questions, that would be wonderful. Um, finally, before we get rolling here with questions, I think we have got a word from our sponsor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hans Rasmussen, and it's good to be with you virtually at the Illinois Soybean Summit. It's my privilege to represent the Brandt Group of Companies at this event today. 
I've been with Brandt since late 2017 when the company acquired the former Kungskill plant here in Hudson. Since then, we have retooled the entire plant, hired local workers, and are now very busy building some of the most durable and productive farm equipment and construction attachments in the industry. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the Brandt Group of Companies is a family-owned manufacturing and distribution firm headquartered in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. We have more than 100 locations across North America, over 3,400 employees, and a growing international audience serving the agriculture, construction, forestry, rail, mining, steel, and energy industries with unique custom products. We are working hard to serve American farmers every day through our Brandt Agricultural Products Division. Our team designs, manufactures, and supports a complete lineup of hardworking belt conveyors, augers, grain carts, grain vacs, and grain bagging equipment. We build many of these units just down the road here in Hudson. These products are sold and serviced by a rapidly growing network of nearly 400 independent dealer locations across the U.S., Canada, and around the world. I welcome you to make the short drive to Hudson to see what we're up to these days. Call me anytime, I'd be proud to show you around. We're very excited about the equipment that we build because we know from experience that it helps farmers across the American Midwest to be more productive and profitable every single day. Enjoy this year's Soybean Summit. It's been good to talk to you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and transition into our panel. So um, I have shared a little bit today about each of our, our panelists, but um, gentlemen, I would love to hear a little bit more about you, uh, why it is you're here, why it is that you decided to join us today talking about balancing farm, family, and, um, and stress. So I'm going to start with you, Michael Moore, if you don't mind. Give us a little insight. Um, so, what, kind of one of the reasons why I'm here is uh, my family farm, we're trying to limit our stress and have a succession plan in place to, to uh, ensure the continuation of our farm. So, part of what, my, what I'm trying to do is get that done because, it, you know, having a certain future you know knowing that i'm going to still be able to farm in in you know 20 30 years is will help eliminate a lot of the stress of farming definitely yeah and there and i know your uh your interest in succession planning is is pretty passionate right now anyway and so um we'd love to hear more about that as we continue talking today um mike downing can you share a bit about yourself and why you're here today Yeah, good morning. I, th thanks for the opportunity. I guess what compelled me to um, take the opportunity with this panel is I, I just see it every day, um, working with uh, different situations with the farm families that we consult with, whether that's transition planning, succession planning, uh, financial consulting. When you just think about the last couple of years, the uh, uncertainty and the volatility that we've gone through from you know trade wars to uh, pandemics. Um, right on the front page of the Des Moines Register this past Sunday was an uh, article that bankruptcies here in the state of Iowa had reached a 10-year high. And that's all with uh, starting a year with, you know, uh, strong commodity prices. And so it's just a lot of swings. And what I've found in working with families is it just, you know, leads to additional stress. And uh, I think there's some studies out there, even there, even with marriages, one of the uh, primary stress points is uh, it comes down to financial uh, financial reasons um, but I've also seen a, uh, the root of a lot of problems is communication and uh, and I as we look at the next generation uh, the transition that's going to occur over the next 10 to 15 years a lot of this farmland is going to transition to a generation that didn't grow up in the farm didn't it's not going to operate it themselves is maybe more removed so the importance of communication and educating our next generation is really important. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm 
here to you know share a little feedback from our side. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, and and I really appreciate what you're saying. I've done a little bit of personal research on the whole um, financial role of stress in our farm families, and it's definitely um, it's definitely large, but there's so much more out there. So I appreciate that mention of communication as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Randy, um, our longtime farmer. Welcome aboard. Can you can you share a bit why you're here? Well, yes, I've been involved in agriculture for a long time. Uh, uh, I really have a passion for agriculture. I really have a passion for farmers and helping them. And I've been involved in, you know, the Illinois Farm Bureau. I was involved on the policy side and the U.S. Meat Export Federation. I was involved in international trade. Uh, now I'm more involved with FBFM and trying to uh, uh, help farmers have better financial information to make better decisions on. And so all of these things have been stressful to people, uh, you know, policies, markets, finances have all been stressful. And I, I just kind of wanted to help people figure out how to make better decisions on uh, issues that they have. So that's kind of why I'm here. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. You kind of been there, done that, seen it, smelt it, all of the above, right? <laughs> I have. Wonderful. All right. Well, so let's talk a little bit about these concerns that we're feeling. You know, we we're talking about stress and we've mentioned a little bit about communication. We've mentioned a little bit about finances. But as you look ahead into uh, 2021, you know, we know that agriculture faces a lot of uncertainty. And that's part of where the stress comes from is just this dynamic of uncertainty. Um, how about uh, Randy, let's just jump in with you again, friend. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you're concerned with for the upcoming year? Well, I, you know, basically, you know, farming is always changing. We always have challenges. If you don't want change, agriculture is probably not where you should be. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that we're trying to look at in our operation day is be prepared for change. What do we have? What do we look for? Uh, I also think uh, for us, we have a, a kind of a team that we put together that we can uh, talk to, uh, communicate with, to understand other people's opinions. Uh, FBFM person is uh, extremely important for us. Our lender, our banker, uh, our people that we market with, our people that we have input with, all those we feel like it's a, it's a two-way communication. If they don't understand what we are doing, how in the world can they solve our problems too? And uh, I think all that helps solve stress. The other thing is financial stress. Obviously, agriculture has its share of financial stress. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> we have tried to do over the years is try to have a strong balance sheet it allows us to make decisions. It also keeps us from making decisions we shouldn't make. In other words, uh, uh, it's very tempting to buy that 80 right next to you, but if it doesn't make sense financially, why go ahead and do it? Land's always trading, maybe not right next to you. So those are some of the things. But I, <clears throat> that finally, the, the other thing that I think is extremely important, at least has been in our operation, is family communication. Um, I have a son that has come back. I have a daughter that uh, lives close and helps with the uh, hog uh, information, data information. Daughter-in-law that helps with data information. And another son that's involved in uh, agriculture uh, uh, in, in the St. Louis area. All of us are involved in the farming operation. We always have meetings, uh, try to have at least two or three a year. We can sit down this year, it's been Zoom. Uh, we talk to each other and we all kind of have an idea of where things are going. I think it's also important for the parents, grandparents, what have you, to express their desires of where they hope the operation goes that can alleviate a lot of stress for a lot of people. As long as everybody communicates, I think that's good. The last thing I'm gonna say is take a break. Uh, I didn't just start doing this till later in my career, but uh, 
Uh, I think it's important for farmers, especially, to take a break every now and then. Uh, maybe it's a weekend, maybe it's a week, a, a whole week. Marianne and I have traveled in about 40 different countries through our uh, career, and we've learned a great deal from that. So it's, uh, I think it's very important to relieve stress by doing those things that I've talked about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and I think it's interesting because we all, as as farm families want to be productive. And so we we think that taking a break is not a productive use of time sometimes, but we forget that taking those breaks does allow us to think more clearly, to act you know, uh, less impulsively sometimes, to um, be better rested so that you can get your work done in a better way and in a safer way. So uh, I appreciate that, that comment there about taking a break. Um, Michael Moore, you're also kind of trying to balance family. Can you talk to us a little bit about your concerns for the year? Uh, so yeah, uh, my biggest concern is, you know, that with the new administration, what's gonna, what are they gonna be bringing to the table? Um, you, you know, there's been a lot of speculation. There's been a lot of talk. Nothing's really come out yet with, you know, the tax plan or anything like that. But you know, trying to figure out what to do. You know, how how can we um, work that so that it doesn't hurt us you know you know there's a lot of people that are thinking about putting land in trust now because biden has talked about uh removing the stepped up basis and increasing inheritance tax you know that's that's a concern um, weather's always a concern um, but there's not much we can do about that um, we just kind of have to go with the flow on that um you know the markets are always fluctuating that's another concern but we just have to you know watch the market and and hopefully we can make the make the best sales we can for you know uh, our crops and our livestock um and the another thing is you know trying to manage you know i have the farm i have my family and i also uh started an off-farm job so trying to manage all three of those and do it to where I'm not um, hurting one or the other is it's, it's difficult. It's, it's stressful. And, and my, my family time um, we've, we've found that uh, camping has been really beneficial. It's uh, we, we bought a camper last year and we go and take weekends and go camping and we fish and take hikes and things like that. And that has really helped out a lot. So, um, so those are kind of my concerns right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and it's interesting because the, the concerns are always, again, there's a lot of uncertainties. We're always kind of concerned in several areas, but right now it's kind of like when it rains, it pours, you know, there's, there's a lot of different avenues that, uh, that, that we can have concerns about. So Mike Downey, what have you seen in your farm families and in, uh, that you work with and, and as well as yourself, what are some concerns you have? Yeah, I think uh, most families, I'm sure like everybody listening here today, is were, was glad to see 2020 um, in the rear view mirror. Um, but my, but we also feel that, you know, who knows, maybe 2021 will have another story in of itself. We just don't know what that is yet. Um, but certainly, I think uh, Michael and Randy hit some great points there that, you know, uh, agriculture will, is always a cyclical business. And, you know, it's been that way for the last 50, 60, 70 years. So being able to adapt to change, uh, whether that's tax laws, technology, um, weather, uh, grain markets, whatever that might be. And uh, we're telling our clients that we feel we have 10 months to do some planning. Um, the problem is we don't know what we're planning for yet, um, but we can still put the foundation in place to make some, some quick uh, decisions if we have to toward the end of this year. Um, but I think the uh, overcompassing uh, when I'm looking forward just in agriculture in general, we're, we're eternal optimists, bullish agriculture. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, it's come out now that Bill Gates is the uh, largest landowner now in the United States. But when, you know, sit back and really think about that, because there's other wealthy individuals, too, that are entering the marketplace, other institutional groups. Um, you know, everybody wants a piece of farmland now. Why is that? And uh, 
know, I think we really need to think about that. And I think there are some reasons, some motives. You know, certainly controlling the food supply is one that uh, has been talked about, you know, and but that's, uh, I think as agriculture, we need to do a better job telling our story, communicating to the next generation. And uh, so I think as we look forward, that's uh, probably what's on our concern list. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And I, I think, you know, I remember in 2019, I really started getting into the mental health advocacy arena. And uh, I, I remember saying, you know, this was a bad year, guys. It was a bad year and we have those, but it's going to get better, you know. And uh, and then 2020 hit and kind of said, hold my beverage, right? He <laughs> said, we got more to throw at you. And so, um, you know, there are, there, there are always ups. We are always going to get out of these stressful times, definitely. But unfortunately, the stressful periods can last a while, right? It can get worse before it gets better sometimes. So, um, so that, that stress can get pretty heavy. And, and this is a, a concept of stress and mental health that we haven't been super vocal about in agriculture until the last couple of years. So, Let's talk a little bit about that and, and about how these discussions have worked. Uh, Michael, you know, we all have stress. Everybody in every occupation has stress. But unfortunately, in agriculture, uh, with farmers, we do see more depression, we see more anxiety, and unfortunately, we see more suicide in farmers than, um, than other occupations. So what is it that you think makes farming so uniquely stressful? Um, so that's... Uh kind of a tough question, uh, but I think for me, uh, what makes farming stressful for me isn't the actual work of farming. It's not, you know, planting harvest, building fence, things like that. It's the financial uncertainty from year to year, depending on, you know, markets and yields and weather. I mean, there's a lot of things that farmers just can't control. And knowing that, um you know you, you it's hard on some people because you know like for me i have a family and, and at the end of the year i want to make sure i can provide for my family and having that financial uh stability is is hard sometimes in farming especially the last couple of years we're kind of seeing a, a nice upswing in the markets but the last couple of years have been really tough and there there have been times where i've come home you know not not happy and and it's hard to leave that at the door and and spend time with your family um and and spend quality time with your family and not bring that into into the home and that's just you know for me that was probably some of the most stressful times um when you know you, you look at your sales and that you just you just don't know how you're going to pay your pay your bills so yeah you know thank you michael for sharing that i know uh, when I found out that I was doing some research on mental health and farming and I found out that, you know, farming is one of the most stressful occupations. And I was a counselor at the time. I was a school counselor. And I thought, there ain't no way anybody has a job more stressful than mine right now, right? And I think we all have that. We all feel, you know, that, that we're all going through a lot of stress. But what I have since learned, and especially after being immersed in this agriculture and this farming full-time life in the last 10 years, is that farming has a, you know, a unique setup of, of several things that at one time pile on, you know, and I think a lot of it, like you said, is financial. Um, as a counselor, it can be a stressful day, but I've still got a paycheck. And that I think is is a huge part of where farm stress comes from. And you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, that stuff that's out of your control, that's another thing. You know, a lot of people have bits and pieces of their of their job and their life that are out of control. But in farming, those things that are out of control can make or break your entire operation. You know, they can make or break your your pocketbook. And and so it's it's a I think it's a little bit larger scale than maybe some other occupations. Um, Randy, you've been a farmer for decades, right? You've seen challenging seasons, you've seen hard stuff, you've been in tough situations. Why do you think it's important that we talk about these stresses in a little more public or at least, um, you know, getting it off of your chest a little bit more? And who do you rely on for that support? Well, uh, I agree with what has been said about stress and so forth, but the way that our family has tried to manage it, and I say tried, we aren't perfect, nobody's perfect, but 
Uh, one of the things that we try to do is set some goals. Uh, some of them are short-term goals, some of them are long-term goals. And, and uh, for example, one of the things that uh, we have a goal, a long-term goal, if a piece of property comes up next to us, we just absolutely figure out a way to purchase that, that property. And uh, thank goodness, five generations before me have done the same thing. So it's kind of nice to have one fuel tank on the whole farm that does everything. So, but that's a plan that we've had for generations. It isn't just ours and we've continued it. The, the, but we do set up yearly goals, uh, not necessarily, uh, my son does the goals for crops and yields and so forth, but we kind of set up goals of how much money we hope to be able to distribute and we sell things when we have an opportunity to meet our goals. The, the other thing that I think helps in communication and with stress is I think that all of us need to know our lender or our banker as well as anybody. Uh, uh, that communication between the lender and the banker, uh, and at least in my lifetime or my career has been extremely important. It basically comes down to trust, to understanding each other. If we hit bad times, he understands that we'll probably get through it and be able to pay him back. So I think that's a very critical. And then the, the other thing, and this happened this year with us, we had a client that was buying our, our wiener pigs that couldn't get rid of his fat hogs, uh, called me up and said, I can't buy your pigs, can't get rid of the fat hogs. We have nowhere to go with them. Uh, actually, his banker called me and said, I just want you to know that he will not be paying you for any pigs that you deliver. Well, that's a pretty stern message. And when that was going on, there really wasn't anything to do but euthanize the pigs. So we had to do that. That's probably the most stress that our, 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 our swine company has had, especially on the employees. They've done everything they can to, to make those pigs good. But you know what? We made it through that. We talked about it. We said things are going to be better. We communicated with the employees. We continually worked together to get through that issue. And we did. And now we're seeing some of the rewards of it. So uh, I really, truly believe communicating with the people that you deal with, both clients, lenders, family, uh, can alleviate a lot of stress. Don't carry it all yourself spread it out amongst other people as lead, be honest with everybody and uh, uh, make sure everybody understands where we're going. That's kind of the way we've done it, okay? Thank you, Randy. And you've described a really great example of how you, you know, again, you, like you said, you don't hold it all in. Stress isn't something that is only on your shoulders. We kind of work as a team. You've described your lenders, you've described your, your employees, your family, all sorts of different people that you've had on your team um, so that you can help all of you can be supported and in, in, with each other and supportive of each other throughout those tough times. So thank you so much. Um, Mike Downey, uh, accountants, lawyers, bankers, landlords, you talk to them all right now in your line of work. And, and there are all sorts of difficult conversations I know that you have, whether they're financial or, you know, with, with transitioning. Um, what do you think about stress? Do you think talking about stress and mental health is one of those tough conversations? And, and if so, how might we encourage farmers to see value in having those conversations? You bet. No, I definitely think it's uh, very important. And, uh, you know, when I think about it, we're working now with, you know, five, maybe even six different generations in family farm transition. Um, every one of those generations communicates differently. Every one of those generations handles stress differently. Um, one thing I've noticed with my grandparents' generation as a general rule is they're more secretive, uh, holding things in to ourself. Um, one thing we're seeing from the incoming generation coming up is uh, a lot more open. Um, we're getting a lot of interest for peer groups. Um, you know, younger producers teaming up into peer groups. They want to learn from one another. And I think that's, uh, you know, when we're talking about stress, you know, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, make sure that you're aware you're not alone. There's others that have been gone, that have gone through this. And I think we're going to see more of a trend in the industry of collaboration between operations and mentoring peer groups. I think that's all uh, 
a positive trend for the topic we're talking about today with stress. And uh, But definitely who your team is, who your trusted advisors, just like what Randy and Michael have said, very important. And uh, and that's you know really an issue out there. We spend a lot of our time um, talking about we need to find more young farmers to come back. Well, that is what we're hearing in the practitioner world too. We need more young people to come back, attorneys, accountants, lawyers, lenders, uh, to carry forward our practice. So that's an issue that we're seeing. And some farm families have to tra travel much farther than they're used to, to go seek out a specialist, you know, to work with. So, uh, but all good stuff. And uh, so I think, uh, again, just uh, who your team is, uh, very, very important. Absolutely. You shared a lot of innovative ideas there with peer groups and, and different, uh, you know, being more comfortable with different groups, finding the group that you are comfortable with talking to. And so we're going to expand on that communication a little bit. Um, how do we communicate with stakeholders and especially during a pandemic? Randy, um, you know, you not only work on the farm, but you are really active, like you said, in Farm Bureau, in your community, sitting on boards. Uh, what is it? What's the lesson you've learned when it comes to communication? And, and has there any been anything during this pandemic that's been especially important to communicate? Yeah, I've learned how to use Zoom. That's something that uh, I had no idea what that was. And it's kind of neat that uh, uh, my guess is uh, a lot of the activities that I have, uh, we're not going to have near the cost that we've had private or previously. So, but that's by the side. Uh, uh, yeah, as far as organizations go, uh, the pandemic has obviously disrupted a lot of that. But you know what? We've learned how to work through that. Uh, we still continue to have some meetings. We continue to have operations that go forward. So uh, uh, I, I think the pandemic, as far as I'm concerned, on the green side, uh, I think we're kind of lucky. <laughs> uh, we sit out here kind of by ourselves. Uh, we don't wear masks in a tractor. We don't wear mask. We do wear masks in the hog facilities. I will say that. But uh, by and large, we've been fairly uh, uh, away from the COVID pandemic in the agri in the farming side. On the swine side, it's been very, very very effective. We uh, have several of our employees come from uh, Beardstown, where the uh, uh, pork plant is over there and that was a real concern for us because we had people that had had spouses or family that they had to stay at home and couldn't come to work. That's a real issue for us but uh, uh, we were able to manage our way through it. Uh, here again communication, communication, communication. Uh, uh, I can't overemphasize that. Uh, our manager and my son uh, talk two or three times a day and uh, we were able to work our way through that. Um, we hope it's behind us. Who knows? Uh, uh, we'll see. It looks like it's promising at this point. The other thing that has helped us through the pandemic is we had some goals for last year. We have goals for this year. Um, that really is nice to be able to have your goals, have them listed and continue to work toward them. Uh, you don't have to, sure, you have to, you have to do some different things when things come at you, but you still have your goals and you do your best to achieve what you set out to do. And as long as your family and everybody understands your goals, uh, yeah, the pandemic's I haven't been able to take two or three trips that I wanted to take, but other than that, we still are working for our goals of the farm, and I think that's relieved a lot of our stress. Yeah, yeah, really, it's funny when we describe grain farmers. That's you know, my husband is is primarily a grain farmer. We have a little bit of cattle too, and when the pandemic first started, we were kind of like, well. I guess we just get more family time, right? <laughs> you know, because we were kind of out here in the middle of nowhere. But we did quickly learn that, you know, that we miss out on the isolation, uh, on the on the non-isolating parts of farming. You know, as grain farmers, we are here kind of by ourselves. And so not being able to attend meetings in person or conferences in person was something that we struggled with, especially again, having the kids here at home. Um, you know, it's wonderful to have that family time and we cherish that definitely. 
Um, but, you know, it's not always easy. And so having those stress relieving times where we can get out and communicate with each other in person, not on Zoom, um, has been something we've really missed. Uh, Mike, how about you? In your line of work, you kind of communicate with all different types of stakeholders on behalf of your clients. So can you talk about what happens when not everybody's on the same page and, and why working together, um, you know, is, is the best approach for farm families, especially during these pandemic difficult times? You bet. Well, you know, I spend, you know, my passion is preserving the family farm. And that's what I, you know, focus on is uh, keeping the farm and the family. But unfortunately, sometimes we're called in where we're trying to um, make the best out of a very difficult situation. And, you know, last year I was asked to mediate three basically family divorces, uh, family farm divorces. Um, whether it was father, son, or um, uncle, nephew, whatever, you know, three, you know, brothers, whatever the case might be. And um, so, you know, obviously, you know, it, you know, that's the worst case scenario we all want to avoid, but that's, that's what's out there that can happen. Uh, Randy hit it on the head for me. All three of those cases, when I was thinking about those while he was talking, came down to communication. And, uh, we can typically work through the financial issues, uh, management issues, leadership styles, and those sort of things. But uh, uh, in a lot of cases, it, came, it comes down to communication and understanding that everybody does have different ways to communicate, different personality styles. And uh, for that reason, we under, need to understand that people communicate differently. And uh, so that's all very important stuff. So, Yeah. Oh, wow. That really resonates with me. Um, and I think that we sometimes in our farm families get very focused on the way things have always been. And this is the way it's, you know, it's worked for us. So we don't really worry about changing that. And I think communication is one of those things that's the same way. You know, if there's something more you can be doing to share your thoughts about something, um, whether it's generation to generation, you know, you've got older farmers and younger farmers. If we can talk more, like Randy said, getting on the same page about our goals. Um, you know, that that's something that we always, we can't just say, well, this is the way it's always been. You know, if we're a family who always text messages, that's going to be our, the way we're only going to communicate. Or if we've never had a family meeting, that doesn't mean you can't have one, you know? So we've got to be kind of open-minded with our, uh, with our stakeholders and, and with our families as far as how we can communicate to kind of make change. Uh, Michael, your return to the farm sparked your interest again in, in succession planning. And as you mentioned earlier, kind of that idea of how are we gonna keep this going? So can you share a bit about that, how that conversation worked for you and, and what barriers uh, you know, you've know you come across? Yeah, so when I, when I first came home back in May of 2014, um, I was, you know, I'd been away from the farm for about, you know, seven years. And so I was, getting my feet back under me, kind of, you know, figuring stuff out. And then a couple of years, probably two years after I came home, started really looking into succession planning because I started thinking, okay, well, what, how, how can we guarantee that the farm is going to continue once my dad retires or if, say, one of my kids decides that they want to come back home and farm? Um, so at first it was a little difficult uh, my dad was heavily involved in uh, American Soybean Association, so he was not home very often. So having that conversation was a little difficult. Um, they knew that something needed to be done, but he was so busy that he just didn't have time to do it. Um, we had time last, so about a year ago, we... Uh, decided that, okay, we, we need to start thinking about it. And, and, and it was, you know, it was a good conversation. Uh, both of my, my mom and my dad both decided that, you know, it was, it was time. And then COVID hit and everything shut down. And that kind of put our plans on hold until we kind of felt comfortable going back into it again. Um, I've still been doing research on it, looking stuff up, going to webinars and, and you know, things like that. Uh, but it has been the, the trying to communicate without doing it in person because that's when you're doing a succession plan, 
trying to do things over email or Zoom or anything like that, it's just, it's difficult. Um, so we're, we're kind of hoping that maybe in the coming months, maybe this summer, uh, we'll be able to get back into that and, and try and get something put together. Yeah, and and I think I watched a video that you were on recently talking about this, and I think it was your dad who said, you know, this is this is a hard conversation because this is the idea that I'm not going to be farming at some point, you know, or that I'm going to have to pass this on. And I do think that's a really difficult conversation for both generations involved and all generations involved, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, nobody wants to talk about the end of something. Nobody, I mean, you know, whether it's retirement or somebody passes away, nobody wants to talk about that, but you kind of have to put your emotions aside and think about the, the operation and what's best for the operation. Right. I, I really think there does come a time that you want to start talking about it from another perspective, because I do think you've worked all your life to have something, Mike, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, mm -hmm. hey, time's catching up with me. What are we going to do to this? So uh, I encourage you to keep working on it. The earlier you can put those plans in place, the better plan will be, and you've got time to change them if they aren't quite right. So uh, right. there yeah. does come a time when, holy, we got to get something done here. So, uh, and the earlier you can do it, the better off you are. I, I encourage yep. you to keep doing it, okay? Yeah, and, and Randy, you know, you're exactly right, because what are you really working for? You know, you, you put all your time and your life into your blood, sweat, and tears, right? Everything is into the farm. And at the end of the day, if you're just going to hang on to it, well, what's going to happen when you're not there? You know, if you if, if you really want to see some value into the effort you've put into it as a, as a person and as a farmer, um, you know, you got to you got to make that next step. But it's hard. It's a hard conversation um, when we think about managing our farm. Uh, we do a lot of thinking about all the little the, the the assets that we have on the farm and we don't always think about the greatest asset in the farm and that of course is the farmer um so mike downey can you share what advice do you have for other stakeholders when it comes to prioritizing the people on the farm the farm families yeah this you know hits home for me um just with a family i just worked with and Illinois and uh, and it, it really kind of came down everybody's heard this the, the saying I don't really know who's saying it is but uh, faith family farm and uh, it, and I was originally brought in because there's some communication issues between three to you know three generational farm grandparents parents and the, the third generation coming in and uh, father son were at extreme opposite ends of the personality spectrum <laughs> so there were you know uh they definitely communicated in in different ways but you know once we kind of unpeeled the layers of the onion if you will um it, interesting enough it came down to faith family farm and how each generation how do you rank those because one generation had farm rated first another um you know, faith was late, you know, rated first, but for the incoming generation, it was family. They wanted family time and it was about the people. And uh, so there was, you know, it was interesting working through that. Ultimately they did, it was just uh, good to get on the table and have a discussion. Um, but for them, uh, you know, end of the day, the farmer, the people making some time for family and, um, you know, getting some time away from the farm even is a healthy thing, I think, just to, encourage folks to do so thank you yeah, i love that and, and you know i heard a speaker once who said you know you know write down what it is that you prioritize is it faith is it family is it farming what is it and then go out and prove it you know because we have this idea in our mind that this is what's most important um you know a lot of people say family is most important but what are you actually doing to prove that how are you actually prioritizing your family? Are you actually prioritizing your family? You know, so it takes a lot of self-awareness and reflection and kind of being introspective and honest with yourself about really, uh, really proving what it is that you value. 
Michael, I'm going to jump to you. When it comes to family farms, you know, like we said, we're not just talking about having employees or coworkers. Uh, HR means something a little bit different because a lot of times we're talking about our family. So as a young farmer with a growing family, a one and a half year old, um, what are some ways that you're learning to balance life as both a farmer and a family member and a father? So it's it's uh, it's definitely not easy. Um, about a year ago, oh, about two years ago, I, I started an off-farm job, um, but I'm my own boss with that. So it's easy to make my own hours and I can kind of work around schedules. Um, but in the last year with COVID, um, there were times where I was, you know, I had to stay home with the kids. Daycare was closed, school was closed. And, you know, that was, that was good. Um, I got a lot of quality time with my kids, but, you know, it, it, I felt it was stressful because I didn't know what was going on on the farm. I didn't know if, you know, things were getting done or not, or I just felt like, you know, there were times that I just, I wanted to be on the farm to make sure things were getting done. Um, luckily, you know, my dad has been farming for 40 plus years and he took care of all that. So that was a, a peace of mind for me. Um, but finding. Looks like Michael may have frozen up. Michael, if you're still talking, I'm just going to let you know I can't hear you. Michael, Mike and Randy, are you the same? Do you see Michael frozen there? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, hopefully we'll have Michael joining us back on and, and sharing a little bit more about that balancing life as a, as a farmer and a father. Um, but I'm going to jump, let's see here, to Randy. Um, you know, you have, have provided great leadership for your farm over the, the years. And, and your farm is successful because not only for that leadership, but also because of all of the people who are involved in the farm. So I know you mentioned this briefly, but but has COVID had much of an impact on your on your farm? And and how have you adapted to those changes that have been happening recently? Uh, well, I did touch on it briefly, and and I I think the 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 biggest thing that we were able to do is communicate. I mean, I think that's that's it, and none, none of us knew what was going to happen tomorrow with this thing and uh, uh, you know we all had to adapt and as long as the team and the family which my family is part of the team uh, all kind of had an idea of where we were going to go and how we were going to get there uh, it alleviated some stress did we make some bad decisions you bet we made some bad decisions but you know what we learned from them and we went around them and went on and kept going um you know when we were planning this last year all of us that are in, in farming it was it was you know pretty much normal we were out in the field by ourselves doing what we had to do our suppliers supplied us with what we had to do and uh things went pretty much normal um uh, and I was kind of glad I was a farmer uh, last April and May and June. It was kind of nice to be normal if there was such a word. So uh, was it was such a thing in, in COVID. But I think the thing that that we did in in the COVID situation, the pandemic is communicated. Uh, here again, I have the team. I have the I have my banker. I actually have two bankers. We use the community bank and the farm credit system. And so both of those were well aware of our plan, uh, used our FBFM person uh, very, every month we communicated with them. Uh, did use my lawyer on some issues that we had and came up, uh, but it was primarily the family. We kept everybody informed and uh, you know, it was kind of put one step in front of the other and hope that you were making the right decisions. But uh, in general, I, I actually got COVID uh, first week in August. Uh, very, I, if my daughter hadn't been in the medical field, well, I would have never gotten tested, but I did and I was positive. And you know what? I was kind of glad I had it and it was over with and done with. And uh, uh, I know that there were people that passed away from it so i was the lucky one but uh 
Um, that relieved a lot of stress for me. It was over with and we moved forward. But uh, um, I, I'm just going to go back and say communicate, communicate, communicate. That's how we've made it through. Okay. Do you believe in communication, Randy? <laughs> because I feel like that's a pretty strong uh, message for you today. <laughs> well, I, uh, uh, you can talk to my wife. Sometimes she and I don't communicate as well as we should, but that's uh, almost 50 years of doing that. So we're getting along. You know, and, and that's one thing I love about your responses today, Randy, is that you're not saying, you you know, that you're doing things perfectly and you're not saying that there are never going to be errors, there are never going to be mistakes. What you're saying is you're going to have those times and that's okay. You know, and I think that that's where a lot of our stress in agriculture comes from is that we really beat ourselves up when something happens in a way that we wish it wouldn't have or when we lose a ton of money or when, you know, we have a crop that goes bad or we have an issue with livestock. I mean, those are things that are sometimes outside of our control and they're often outside of our control. And so by just accepting that that is, you know, we're going to do everything we can, but we're going to accept that sometimes bad stuff is going to happen. I think that's something that, you know, having that outlook can, you know, lead to a little bit more positive perspective, right? Um, that being said, we're running short on time. We've got about six minutes left today. So I want to just real briefly, uh, folks, I'm going to give you each a chance to say one last thing that is important to you. Um, and, and hopefully you'll include what is it, speaking of optimism, what is it that you're looking forward to in 2021 and, and possibly in years to come? Um, so, uh, Michael, let's hear from you first. So I guess uh, for 2021, I'm I'm looking forward to getting back to somewhat of a normal um you know we've here in the last couple months we've we're, we've been able to uh our church has been able to start holding uh in-person worship services again because that was awesome to be able to see people again um you know some some groups are starting to meet you know smaller groups um you know the vaccine in our area yeah we're, we're getting the vaccine people getting the vaccine but it's just it's really slow so you know trying to to get into some sort of a back to normal situation um so that you know and then getting a getting our succession plan going again hopefully with with things kind of um moving in the right direction maybe we can get that get to talking to people and meeting people, meeting with people and talking to them, so. Wonderful, thanks, Michael. Um, there's a lot to look forward to, isn't there? Even even though we've, we've kind of run a roller coaster, we've been down and, and now we're ready to be back up again, right? Um, Mike, how about you? You bet, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, when I just look at agriculture in general, um, like I mentioned before, we're, we're definitely optimistic, bullish agriculture, and uh, there'll always be a lot of changes, but um, there, I think there's tons of opportunity ahead, and just a matter of uh, farm operations producers uh, positioning themselves for those opportunities. And, uh, you know, a lot of, when I think about producers, you know, a lot of them, when you think about it, are competing against one another to, to grow, for economies of scale, to compete, but if nothing else, the last year, I think, has also told us that at the end of the day, they'll always band together, you know, whether that's to help someone uh, who had a, a farm accident, um, whatever the case may be. So I think, uh, you know, banding together as an industry, I think, has become more important as we move forward. And uh, so, but I think I'm just uh, optimistic when I think, think ahead, whether it's 2021 or uh, the future, and uh, just... Uh, you know, and I think that's why you're seeing a lot of other interest about agriculture, like I mentioned before, from other people. So. Absolutely. I mean, we've heard it a thousand times, right? Stronger together. That's kind of our our motto in agriculture. And not just this year, it's always been our, our, our motto. We've always been one to step up when, you know, we've got an injured farmer, we've got someone who can't get crop out or whatever. That's, that's kind of what we do. And I hope that in mental health, we continue to see growth in that way as well, that we continue to be vigilant watch keepers for each other. Um, watching for signs of stress, you know, having those discussions that are that are tough discussions, um, because that's that's what we do. You know, we watch out for each other. Randy, you wanna you wanna wrap us up here and share with us what you're looking forward to in the future? 
Well, I guess I could say ditto to Mike and Michael, but uh, you know, I'm opt optimistic. I I think we're going to have some great opportunities in 21. I'm really excited about the uh, strong prices on the green side. On the livestock side, they're causing a little stress, but I'll be that's the way it is. Uh, I'm I'm excited about or looking forward to returning to normal, but I'm not sure what normal is. So that's going to be something we're all going to have to look at, and. Uh, I think I think those of us in agriculture will will continue to strive, we'll continue to make successes, and we'll figure out how how to feed the rest of the world. Uh, you know, that's our role, that's what we do, and I think we'll continue to do that. The new administration is going to give us some curveballs, I'm sure that's but that's pretty much normal with any type of new administration. So uh, uh, we'll watch that. We'll keep abreast to it. But I think we'll continue to produce food at the greatest quantity at the lowest price for the rest of the world. I feel like we need to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all so much for being here. And again, for, for uh, being involved in this conversation. We know that the more that we talk about mental health, the more that we talk about stress, the more that we fuel a connectedness, right? And then we pull people out of that feeling of isolation like they're the only one. So um, I, I really appreciate everyone's contributions today. And I hope that um, you all watching um, will continue this conversation. You being here is so important as well, just to, to learn, take the time to, um, to, to know more about how this all works and, and to be involved in this conversation and continuing it. Um, I know that we uh, need to take some questions. I know we're wrapping up here at 1120. Uh, you, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type it in the ask a question function, which is at that sidebar on the left side of your screen. So feel free uh, to pop on in there and ask a question if you have one. Um, I am going to take this time to remind us that uh, if you are a CCA, don't forget to claim your CEU credit in the professional development for this session. You can either scan the QR code uh, on the screen or email our team with your CCA number by Friday to be submitted for credit. So make sure you get that in by Friday or go ahead and scan the CEU um, QR. Well, thank you again to our sponsor, Brandt, and for uh, all of our panelists and, and for everyone here again being involved in the conversation. We so appreciate it. And um, let's keep on talking, friends. Thank you so much. And we're off, I think. Okay, well, that's a wrap. <laughs>